The Zarogian Empire was the biggest empire that Gilnor had ever seen, being built over centuries by one of the most powerful gods to ever walk the world. Though the empire controlled most of the continent and held considerable power, what events exactly led to its downfall? Saros arrived to Gilanor and left a mark that would affect all life in the world. This video will contain information from old school RuneScape and a few little bits picked up from RuneScape 3 pertaining to the ancient empire. Now with that out of the way, let's get into it and find out what happened when Zaros first arrived in Gilanor. Little information is actually known of the rise of the Empire, due to the eventual eradication of information by Zamorakian and Saradoman forces, so the sources are very scattered. Something we do know for sure is the Empire first began within the Second Age of Gilanor. Saros' arrival to the world is what marks the start of the Second Age, and he arrived next to a small quaint village of Sentiston. With this arrival he saw a vast and unspoiled land, ripe for the taking, and with him he brought vampires from Vampirium to the world. After introducing them to concepts of civilization and sovereignty, they quickly began to see the expansion of his empire. Due to Zaros being one of the first gods to arrive to Gilanor, Amentus' expansion was largely unchecked and he took land as quickly as he could, though the exact details are a mystery within old school RuneScape. As mentioned before, due to the extermination of Zarosian culture and history by other factions, there's little information about how exactly the Empire grew and at what pace. But there's one thing that's certain. Over the course of a few centuries, it became the largest empire Gilanor would ever see. One contributing factor was that so many different races were admitted into the Empire, and they all coexisted in a seeming peace. The likes of the Marjara, demons, vampires, dragon riders, and even humans to some extent. At its peak, the Empire spanned numerous regions. Four and three, now known as the Wilderness, Weiss, Asgarnia, Mistelin, Alcarid, and the northwestern corner of Mauritania, though the Empire predates all of these names. To add a little bit of context there, Weiss was yet to be established. The Wilderness was a lush green landscape covered in forests. The kingdoms of Mistelin and Asgarnia weren't formed and al Karid was named Karad eth as seen on the ancient map. There's no evidence to suggest the Empire had any presence south of the White Wolf Mountain or southeast of the River Lum, though it's generally understood that the lands were under Zarosian control as no other forces lay historical claim to those lands. The name of Mauritania didn't exist either, but we have evidence that suggests that Carnifus is built upon an ancient fortress named Karil. Despite the actual borders of the Empire being shrouded in mystery and debate, it's certain that the Empire bordered Hollowvale to the east, which was the original settlement built before Darkmire. In the Bloody Notes book by Acolyte Otrava, it became apparent that the author is a follower of Saradoman and lived within Hollowvale, as she observed a hollow tree within a forest that had immense energy flowing through it that Zarosian warlocks would use. It spoke to her. A gnarled old voice croaked out in fear at me. Blood and ashes. The chaotic horde approaches. At first I figured it was some type of cruel joke, clearly there must be a man sitting within the tree, hiding from sight. That however, was not the case, the tree was incredibly empty and the voice continued to speak with me. The more I visit the tree, the more it speaks so I thought up a new name, the Chatter Tree. Today it told me of its old home of Karila that was recently destroyed. I corrected the tree of course, the fortress still stands but it wouldn't listen. To the south, the Zarosian Empire bordered with the Caridian Empire at the time a vibrant exotic landscape. Tensions between the Zarosians and Menophytes who led the Caridian Empire would rise over time. To the west, there was little known about the border, though it's likely that Lassar was the Empire's most western fortress given the impenetrable nature of Trollheim and Trollweiss Mountain. The beginning of the end all began with simple dissatisfaction, but the true nature of how it all started is still up for the beef. Things aren't so simple when we try and learn from history, and history is all written by the victors. But there's a few simple facts that can't be questioned. It was no secret that Zaros had allied with questionable characters. All sorts of dark and evil creatures whose very nature was to be power hungry and to betray. So it's no surprise that a lot of these very same creatures were ones that were always looking for some type of way to seize any semblance of power. And because Zaros was more powerful than any other god during the height of the Empire, it made him seem untouchable. But deception is another power in itself, which is perhaps why Saradoman began to apply subterfuge, sending spies and sowing discontent amongst the Zarosian population with this descent eventually becoming a plot to overthrow Zaros, especially when the Marjorat who felt that their conditions did not improve significantly after they defected from the Menophite Icloran's armies. To provide some insight into possibly one of the deadliest battles that Zaros ever faced, 
we're going to briefly cover the Caridian Zarosian War. The war saw Zaros take the lead within the early days, slowly gaining ground over border skirmishes of the two empires, with the Caridians slowly retreating. That was until Ikloran decided to search elsewhere for allies. That's when he ended up in Freeniski, the same realm that Zaros comes from, and recruited their help. With this, the stern judges of Ikloran, as they were called, turned the tide of battle, slowly pushing Zaros' forces away from the sacred lands the Menophytes had inhabited. But unfortunately, this fortune wouldn't last long. Slisk, a Marjorat with his own ambitions, convinced this ilk to defect to Zaros for a better life and more glory. And of course, they did. Abandoning the Menophyte pantheon and joining the ranks of Zaros, the Empire once again pushed hard and began gaining ground. That was until the final battle of this bloody war. Tumakun, the main god of the Menophyte pantheon, was on the field, and he understood the gravity of the situation. He had to intervene and do something, otherwise his lands would be lost to Zaros and his empire. He had done the one thing any noble god would do, sacrifice himself to ensure some type of survival for his people. Though this sacrifice took form in the shape of a giant explosion, not only killing him but wiping out large numbers of forces from both sides of the battle, Caridian and Zarosian alike tearing the trees and grass from the ground to turn the once lush area into an arid, dry desert. This proved to be a fatal blow to Zaros, but he turned his gaze away from the Caridians, leaving them be whilst recuperating from his own losses. Whilst this would be the first of many defeats for Zaros, eventually, within his own ranks, a rebellion was formed, with one Marjorat commander at its helm. A name you'll all be familiar with, Zamorak. That's correct, that Zamorak. Though at this point he was just a mortal who was planning on taking down a god. Alongside other high ranking members of the Zarosian army, like Hazil, Draken, Thamaron, Zemorgul, and Vigora, who were promised large pieces of land to claim as their own if they succeeded. Through a various chain of events that I'll cover in another video, Zamorak ended up with a staff of Armadil. During the confrontation between Zamorak's council and Zaros, it ended up in a 1v1 duel between Zaros and Zamorak with no teleblocks, freezes, or karate specs to be seen. Though he was defeated, knowing he would die, Zaros left his body and retreated to potentially live another day. This betrayal saw the beginning of the end for the Zarosian Empire, into a period we can call the Collapse. Zamorak was banished from Gilinor by the other gods for slaying one of their kind, though this was only a temporary measure and likely fueled his bloodlust even more having become a god and growing stronger with a new army to fall behind him. The power vacuum that opened of a god being killed, the empire was rudderless in a stormy ocean, with Saradoman and Zamorakian forces encroaching on all sides. Though the remaining armies of Zaros tried their best to fight back and survive, it did not go well for them, with one of their greatest weapons next being imprisoned with the greatest army the empire had within the icy walls of the God Wars dungeon. Though Slisk, who at that time supported Zaros, let Nex escape, the other four factions of Armadil, Bando, Samarak and Saradoman banded together just once to force this ancient general back into her cage. Though there's no coherent documentation of how the Empire fell chronologically, it's important to note that the penultimate settlement to fall was the city of Sentistan, capital of the Empire, and the last bulwark to succumb was Carol, as predicted within the Bloody Notes. Other cities and settlements can only be speculated about, but some have crafted an informed hypothesis with an alleged path of enemy forces being seen on screen. Presumably, the fortresses, cities and settlements in 4 and 3 were first to fall, or to be annexed, with the reasoning behind this being that other gods had armies around the God Wars dungeon to capture Nex, with the next logical move being to start expanding from there. Secondly, the only record of this period is by a dragon rider saying how after the Battle of Karlinga, he fled from another Zarusian named Korveth, and he sought shelter in the deep forests of 4 and 3, inside of an abandoned and forgotten temple. This alludes to the fact that 4 and 3 settlements were first to fall. Third, it's logical that the Empire was conquered from its borders of 4 and 3 and Lassar towards its interior, where Padio was geographically, as it would have served as a shield for the capital. From this point on, recorded history resumes. Ultimately, Sentistum fell and was conquered by the forces of Samurak, who kept the city and the name. The Zarosians who survived fled into the Caridian Desert, where some of the gods imprisoned Zaros as high priest, as an Adra inside of a pyramid. The exile of the Zarosians had finally been completed, with their lands, lives and homes stolen. The last fortress to fall was Carol, where the Zamorakian forces invaded in the dead of night and wiped everyone out, truly extinguishing the flame of a once mighty empire, turning it to nothing but rubble and dust. 
Though Sentistum would remain a city for a while, it would be invaded by Saradoman forces over the course of the God Wars, and a new city named Saranthium would be built over the rubble of the Zarosian turned Zamorakian city. Though in time, while the city was being built, Zamorak would seek vengeance and retake the city to burn it to the ground, once again casting it to rubble and truly earning the name of the God of Chaos. You may be wondering, as we near the end of this tale, what happened to 4 and 3? Why is it the wilderness? Well, to finish off the history of the Zarosian Empire, during the God Wars when Zamorak was caught into this densely forested region, he used an elder artifact named the Stone of Jast to cause a cataclysmic destruction around him, scarring the land and wiping it clean of any life, turning it into the inhospitable landscape that we now see it as. So the crux of this video was written before Desert Treasure 2 came out, so I decided to add this little extra chapter to look briefly into what remains of the Empire in the modern day, towards the end of the Fifth Age. So there is a slight spoiler warning, but because the quest is still so new, I'm not really going to talk about the major details of it. The Ancient Goal Machine allows us to search terms and find out the status of certain beings and locations within the Ancient Empire though some things are obscure to us. The Marjorat are still present in Gilinor and feature in multiple different storylines, with the most recent one being the Desert storylines. To name some alive, missing or dead, and I do apologise for the pronunciation, we have Akthanakos, Azandara, Bilrak, Hazil, Yalan, Karshe, Khazard, Lamistard, Lucian, Mizark, Palkira, Ralvash, Sliss, Trinidine, Waisietl, Zamorak, Zemorigal, and finally, Inacra. And to briefly mention Desert Treasure 2, without going into too much detail as the quest is still new, Jagex has provided us with a treasure trove of information about the old empire and of things to come, namely with the Elder artifacts like the Stone of Jazz and the Elder Horn. Just like in RuneScape 3, Slisk is up to his nefarious schemes, being the self-serving snake he is. I won't include information about the quest entirely here, as it may be best left for a future video. That's the tale of the Zarosian Empire, a seemingly indestructible force that was vanquished and buried beneath the sands of time. Don't get me wrong, there are still a few that worship him. The men are fighting over small cults and he plays a much bigger role in RuneScape 3, but his story in old school RuneScape is still so young, so who knows what can happen. He's mentioned plenty of times and various quests revolve around some aspect of Zaros. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and if you did, please do like and subscribe. I think I'm going to be doing more old school RuneScape content going forward with some lore videos for the time being. I've got a few videos that I'm working on in the pipeline at the moment anyway, but if you guys want to see me cover something specific, just let me know down in the comments below. But as always, thanks for watching, and see you next time.